Hi, my name is Ken Lottie. I'm here to talk to you today about selling IO psychology. I'm an IO psychologist with about 15 years experience and over that time I've worked with, talked with, spoken with, and sold to uh, hundreds of senior leaders across hundreds of organizations. So what I want to do today is try to boil down some of the best uh, top tips and best practices that I've come up with in terms of connecting to um, connecting with senior leaders and helping them buy IO psychology programs. Now, most of us probably didn't get into the field of IO psychology because we love sales. Um, so what is this really about? Sales usually has, it kind of feels like a dirty word. I generally think of salespeople, you know, in the same category as politicians and those infomercial guys. Um, but really what we're talking about here is actually influence and communication. If you think about who's really selling IO psychology, it's all of us. Educators are trying to persuade and influence uh, students to learn about IO psychology, to believe the findings of the field and the philosophies and methodologies of the field, and to possibly consider that as a career. Researchers are trying to get grants approved and projects approved um, and to, to basically secure funding uh, and convince others that their uh, ideas have merit. Internal consultants are trying to convince their own organizations to move forward with a, a project or an intervention. And then external consultants and business owners obviously need to actually go out and, and um, sing for their supper and uh, effectively communicate with customers in order to win business and make money for themselves. So really this applies to everyone. But we're not going to be talking about tricks. We're not talking about manipulation. What we're talking about is a, a really rational process of helping people solve their problems. And if we think of sales as that, as a way of partnering with our customers, then I think a lot of the negative connotation goes away and we can really focus on getting, getting uh, down to business and hopefully getting more IO psychology out there in the world. It's important to think about the customer life cycle and how we get and keep customers. A customer is anyone who buys something from us. The process that they're going through is a stepwise process where first they become aware of possible solutions in the marketplace. Once they're aware of those solutions, they then go into a process of learning about more of those solutions and possibly having a dialogue about purchasing those. So that's a buying process. Once they've bought something, they're getting into implementation and actually you know, using or doing the project, the tool, the program that's been put in place for them. And lastly, there's a sustained period. That is, after the implementation, are they getting value out of it? Is it meeting their expectations? Now, as the customer is walking through their process, we are walking along arm in arm with them at each stage. To raise awareness, what we need to be doing is marketing. And you can put different words on this, but really what we're trying to do is raise awareness of the fact that we exist as a field, as a company, as a consultant, as a team internally. Whatever it is, you need to first make sure that you're on somebody's radar. Once you do that, and they start to engage in a dialogue with you, you're really in the sales process. That's what we're going to focus on mostly today. Um, but you also should be aware that you have opportunities at each one of these stages to influence the success or failure of the client-customer uh, relationship. Delivery is when we're actually implementing the tools with the customer, and then retention are the things we can do to keep them. At each one of these stages, customers are dropping off, potentially. There's fewer and fewer companies or prospective customers uh, that, that are going through each of these phases with us from beginning to end. So each one of these represents an area that you could focus on to improve your practice, to improve your success. Today we're going to focus primarily on the sales stage. If you want to understand the sales process and how to better connect with customers and have more effectiveness uh, getting IO psychology interventions uh, purchased and implemented, you really need to put yourself in the customer's shoes. Put yourself in the customer's head and understand what they're going through when they're making a complex buying decision. Uh, this, In our personal lives, this is when we're buying a house, when we're buying a car, when we're buying something really big. We go through a pretty rational process, and generally speaking, it looks something like this stage model. Um, first, there's an identification of need, followed by learning about solutions, followed by a purchasing process, and lastly, followed by a, a period of experiencing the value and either being happy or, or unhappy with what you bought. Um, a little bit of detail about each of these stages. In the need phase, generally speaking, there's some type of a change, some type of a catalyst that has brought this to the awareness to the point where the customer is going to act on it. 
Um, usually this is also accompanied in an organizational context by pain that's being felt by the organization. Um, so there's an issue that needs solving and for, there's some reason that now is the time we want to solve that issue. As someone who's working with a customer, you need to understand both of those. What was the catalyst? Why are we talking today? Why are you solving this now? Why not six months from now or why not two years ago? Um, so to understand the change context, that, that whether it's competitive pressure, a change in leadership, uh, whatever the case may be, but you really want to understand that because it helps you understand what they're going through and, and how to move them forward. And you also want to understand and wherever possible quantify the pain. Um, have the organization describe all the things that are going wrong and really get them to list those out. In a perfect world, you actually get them to attach a dollar value to these. And the whole point of doing this is so that later on when you propose a solution, um, they're not thinking about the cost of the solution, they're thinking about the cost of not going with your solution, which is the cost of the pain they're experiencing. Uh, in the learning process, they're going to be researching alternatives and, uh, and comparing alternatives. So they're going to be looking at how could I solve this, what types of uh, vendors, providers, organizations, consultants are out there, and then they're going to start to compare those against each other based on features and their perceived fit to the needs that they have. During the buying phase, uh, there's a, a, an elaborate dance. Uh, between the seller and the buyer and this is really about getting to a commitment. Um, there might be some things that come up at the last minute, often there's a lengthy contracting process. All of those obstacles are things that usually can be overcome at this stage as long as you're tactfully, professionally and have a trusting relationship uh, and working with, working closely with, uh, with the customer or the buyer. And then lastly, you know, you can influence their perceptions of value throughout by setting realistic expectations and then meeting or exceeding them. Um, that's what's ultimately going to drive the customer satisfaction or dissatisfaction. It's not the absolute value of what you delivered. It's the value relative to what they expected that you were going to deliver. In today's world, though, there are some challenges and, uh, and an opportunity for us as IO psychologists. Uh, the challenge is that people can learn a whole lot without ever talking to us. Um, with the internet, with Google, with search, with web communication, with marketing happening all around, uh, research shows that today buyers actually get more than halfway through, 57% of the way through their buying process before they even talk to potential providers. So unlike in the past where learning about solutions and the alternatives was part of the purchase process, most of that is happening before you even get on the phone with these people. They know a whole heck of a lot about you and your competitors and how you stack up and they have their own preconceptions at that point about where they might even go in order to solve the, solve the problem. So there's less of an opportunity to shape some of those early perceptions and sense of need. But if you adopt a slightly different style and you can be a bit more informed about what they're doing, really understand their industry, their specific company challenges, and what really drove them to the point of, of engaging with you. Uh, and then if you can be assertive and challenging, but in a trusting, partnering way, and kind of be willing to push the customer to question some of their assumptions, or to question some of their hypotheses about how they might solve the solution, or to even challenge some of their perceptions about you or about the competitive landscape, um, some of that will be required now in order to rewind some of the process and kind of reset or help reframe the issues uh, in the customer's mind. So there is a big bit of a challenge, but you know these are smart people. Uh, by and large, the customers we're dealing with are smart, highly motivated, sophisticated business buyers, um, and they will appreciate um, what an IO psychologist brings to that process, which is similarly thoughtful, well-informed, research-based, fact-based uh, approach to solving issues. You have to really know your audience and who you're talking to. Um, the chief human resource officer is different from a recruiting manager and they're different from an operations manager. Uh, and there might be a variety of folks involved in any of the uh, deals that you're involved with. Typically we call these complex buying teams and you really need to try to understand who's who. Often your main point of contact can help you understand the complex buying team. There are folks like sponsors and the empty sponsors. These are folks who are uh, really for or against you as a provider or the approach or the intervention that you're proposing. Um, and there may be good or bad reasons for them to be for or against that. There is the decider um, or deciders. Typically these are the people who actually own the budget. 
and very typically, very rarely is this the person that you're actually talking to. Usually what you're talking to is one of the stakeholders or influencers, or more likely a gatekeeper. Um, stakeholders and influencers are, 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 as they sound, other people who are involved in the decision but don't actually have the final purchase decision and the budget. Gatekeepers are typically technical experts who are going to ensure that you meet some minimal standard before passing you forward to the rest of the complex buying team. Don't get confused and think that the person you're talking to is the customer or is the only customer. More likely they're a gatekeeper and you need to be able to use them to get insight and access to the rest of that complex buying team in order to influence their perceptions. At the end of the day, remember, what's in it for me? All business decisions are personal. Every one of these people on a complex buying team has their own perspective based on their position, their career, their political situation in the organization, and they're trying to achieve certain goals and ambitions. On its face, everyone will talk about how they're trying to solve the organization's needs, but one level down from that, you'll see that there's actually deeply personal goals that people are pursuing. The success of a project that you uh, pitch and implement with, a, with an organization will, um, could make or break someone's career. Um, you know, in addition to does it have the effects that you claim that it would, uh, if it's not received well by users or it ends up, uh, you know, costing a lot more, um, you know, those things could have real consequences on the careers of the people who were involved in that decision. So it sounds like it's all about business and it sounds like it's all about organizations and most buying teams will talk in that language, but at the end of the day, it's all personal and you need to figure out what people's personal agendas are and see if you can help. Uh, connect with those agendas. The way you get this information is by asking questions, lots of questions. You need to connect to what they're coming to you with. So uh, they may be coming to you with a turnover issue um, and you need to be able to talk then about the turnover issue. You might see all kinds of other things that are wrong with the organization. You might see that you know their selection process um, is, is completely wrong. Um, but you need to at least start off by talking about the things that they want to talk about and really meet the customer where they are and then walk them to uh, other alternatives, other considerations, um, expanding the project. As much as possible, you want to avoid jargon and frame the IO intervention in the language and in the topics that they can relate to. If you're talking to a staffing or a talent acquisition team, you know, use the words that they're using in terms of recruiting and attracting top talent. Um, we're still all talking about the same thing, building a great selection system, for example, um, but you need to be able to use their language and avoid IO psychology jargon. When it comes to um, helping them understand what you're going to do, examples, uh, and, you know, examples speak uh, a thousand words, and if you can give them an example from an organization that looks like them, um, that's gold. It, ideally, you have an organization in their industry of similar size. Maybe it's even someone they consider a direct competitor or someone they benchmark with who is facing a similar challenge, and you can talk through that um, situation, that solution. If you don't have anything that precise, then you can look for other connections, folks who looked like them, who were the same size, or who were facing a similar is issue, or who were in the same industry. But you have to be able to talk about how you've solved this issue for other organizations, and they have to be able to see themselves in your examples. It's important for us to take a page as IO psychologists from our clinical and counseling friends. Um, in particular, what we need to do is recognize that their, the client's experience um, it cannot be doubted, uh, disregarded, argued with, uh, and, and rarely challenged. We really need to accept the symptoms or their experience, what they're showing up with, what they're experiencing in terms of pain, um, accept that as the truth. Symptoms are the truth. The causes are hypotheses. And if we can get even our customers to think about this uh, through this lens, that'll be really helpful to us. Um, you want to understand what the customer's hypotheses are about what are the root causes or what might be uh, reasonable solutions to the pain points that they're experiencing. But you can't question the pain. And in fact, you want all the pain out on the table. So you want to get as many of those symptoms out uh, surfaced as possible from as many of the buying team as possible. Um, but once you get to causes, now you're talking about hypotheses. You can guide them towards um, things that we know about in the field that would make uh, excellent solutions and hypotheses. 
but wherever possible, we want to try to make this an empirical question. You know, there's multiple possible hypotheses about the causes. Is there a way to actually build into your project an examination of which of the poss possible root causes are the actual root causes? Uh, it's important to think about conflict as you're engaging with customers. Um, you know, you should prepare for conflict, anticipate why people might resist your solution. It's not going to be just about cost. It's more likely to be about the conflict with their personal ambitions or, or threats that they're seeing or opportunities that they're seeing uh, elsewhere. Identify who is resisting, where the conflict's likely to come from, and really try to get inside their head again about why it is they might be objecting. And then where possible, tell people all the things that could go wrong up front. You can really inoculate against side effects by talking about them up front as possible consequences, um, possible costs, things like that. You need to do that at, at a tactful time, but if the first time they're hearing about possible things that could go wrong or possible costs, uh, un hidden costs, such as uh, the need for a subject matter experts to participate in your intervention, um, if the first time they hear about that is in the project, then you've created an issue for yourself. You do need to deal with conflict, but I'd say pick your battles carefully. If you have a very senior stakeholder who's disagreeing with you, you're going to have to get into serious consulting Aikido mode and really kind of meet them where they are, understand what they're doing, and try to bring them along, turn them around somehow. In a worst case scenario, you can consider the shock and awe approach or the 10 inch pile of paper where if you're being challenged about the validity of something or the likelihood of something working, you know you could just show up with a stack of journal articles, book chapters, uh, you know peer-reviewed evidence that says this stuff works. Uh, you should really reserve that for extreme situations and for folks like the legal team who are gatekeepers, but not necessarily the actual customer. Lastly, just a word about confidence. Remember, we're out there selling science, and science works period. It's the, it's the best uh, epistemological system for building knowledge and models of the world that, that we've devised yet as humanity. It's a self-correcting system of building knowledge and building tools and interventions. So be confident that what we are doing as IO psychologists is useful and, and it does work. Use words like the research shows and speak confidently about the conclusions we can make about how organizations can work better. Um, and wherever possible, give away the science. You're not going to lose a deal because you told a customer how to solve the problem and then they go solve it themselves. Or It's very rare. So to the extent that you can be transparent about the methods that you're going to use and how those methods or the chain of inferences uh, in the project that lead to the conclusion and the solution, to the extent that you can pull the hood back uh, and actually show them what's going on and how the science works, you're going to develop a lot more trust and a lot more acceptance of the solution. And if you find a client who just doesn't get it or just won't get it or doesn't believe in science or has some other kind of fundamental objection, at the end of the day, if you want to keep your ethics and integrity uh, and feel good about yourself as a, as a provider of scientific solutions, you might just need to walk away. In summary then, you have to know the buying process and you have to understand where the people you're talking to are in that buying process in order to know how to approach them, what to talk about, and how best to move them forward to the next stage. You should try whenever possible to get the to understand all of the pain the customer ex is experiencing, to get them to articulate it, and whenever possible get them to actually quantify the pain that they're experiencing in dollar terms. Talk to people. This is all about people. Um, so, you know, we often forget that because we're scientists, we're selling science, we're selling solutions that are research-based. You know, we get very excited about the methodology and the concepts, but at the end of the day, just talk to these people. They're smart, they're motivated, they're trying to solve a problem for their organization, and they're looking to you for help. Um, remember what's in it for me and, and, and each interaction that you have, and then walk the path with them. You know, move, meet them where they are and walk arm in arm through how that solution might look for them. Be confident. We're here representing IO Psychology that has a hundred year foundation in terms of building knowledge and building solutions. So we shall all be able to be proud and, uh, and to walk confidently into any customer meeting and tell them what we can do. I hope some of this was useful and I want to thank you for your time. Please feel free to reach out to me uh, if you want to talk about any of these issues in more depth. Thanks a lot.